All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for episode two of our series of candidates and conversations leading up to the 2020 general election on November 3rd. Tonight's event is honored to be hosted by UC Merced Community Engagement Center and the Office of Government and Community Relations. My name is Jesse Espinoza, and as a fourth year student majoring in political science, I'm excited to be moderating the discussion this evening. During this series, as we sit behind our computer screens, hearing from the candidates that hope to build our community's future, it's clear that we are in unprecedented times. Due to the pandemic, we can't gather to engage in healthy debate and discussion like we normally would. So we felt it was important to find a way for members of our community here at UC Merced, including students, faculty, and staff, to engage with the candidates running to represent them. But this virtual format also makes it easier for the UC Merced community to invite our friends and neighbors to join us in the discussion from the comfort of their own home and without having to deal with campus parking. So welcome to all. And please be sure to let your local fr family, friends, and neighbors know that they're welcome to join us for the upcoming sessions if they miss this one. Additionally, Please be sure to remember to register to vote or make sure that you're already registered to vote by visiting registertovote.ca.gov. Again, that's registertovote.ca.gov. And before we get started, we'd like to pause and acknowledge all the local indigenous people, including the Yokuts and the Miwok, who inhabited this land and thank them for allowing us to live, work, learn, and collaborate on their traditional homeland. Let us now take a moment of gratitude to pay respect to their elders and to all Yokuts and Miwok people, past and present. Thank you. Now let's go over a few housekeeping items. All participants are muted upon entry. We encourage you to use the speaker view instead of gallery view. We will start with some pre-selected questions for the candidate. Participants can type questions into the chat and we will get to as many as we can during our time. If you would like to ask your question live, please use the raise hand function or let us know in the chat and we will unmute you to do so. Again, we will get to as many as we can during our allotted time. Reminder that this is meant to be a conversation and an opportunity to get to know the candidates. So please keep it respectful and on topic. So without further ado, let's get started. Tonight, we have the opportunity to hear from Jeremy Martinez, candidate for Merced City Council, District 5. District 5 encompasses the area from Bear Creek North to Yosemite Avenue, and from G Street West to Highway 59. Mr. Martinez, thank you for joining us. Let's get started with the basics. For your first question, please tell us about your background and why you decided to run for City Council. Yeah, um, so, Originally, I am I'm been born and raised here in the Central Valley. Originally from Turlock, uh, been in Merced for the last twelve years. Uh, this is where I call my home. This is where I'm raising my daughter. This is where I've uh, worked professionally and developed a career. So I um, have no interest in ever leaving this town. Um, it's been a, a journey here. You know, um, from an educational standpoint, I graduated from Stan State with a bachelor's in sociology, uh, an emphasis on political sociology. Came to uh, USC where I received my master's in public administration public policy with a certification in city and county management as well from the Soul Price School for Public Policy. Eventually it worked quite a bit, I would say ooh, 12 years in a professional capacity within the private sector uh, in different levels, uh, eventually an HR director for a private sector company called Westmark out in Atwater. They build uh, transportation trailers, uh, fire trucks, water tenders, et cetera. Um, pretty big outfit, 250 plus employees, four locations. Um, about $50 million a year. So it was a big endeavor. Um, started up the HR department there, which was great. So I got to learn about a lot about policy and how to interpret uh, state policy and turn that into internal policy, if you will, uh, within an organization and ensure that processes flow uh, within that realm. And then um, I was lucky enough while attending USC to uh, interview the past CEO of United Way of Merced County uh, for a nonprofit foundation analysis. And uh, we just kind of clicked. I uh, was offered a role to sit on the Community Investment Committee, which United Way of Merced County used to um, award grants to community-based organizations for specific initiatives around health, education, and financial stability. 
And uh, it was at that moment that I kind of learned um, everything that was going on, going on around in Merced, if you will, uh, that really incited me to get involved. Um, I'm forever thankful for that opportunity because that is literally what led to me really wanting to get involved in, within the city. Because um, I'll be truthful with you, prior to that, I was, I was work school, work school dad, work school dad, kind of all day. And then when I got that exposure, I wanted to get pretty involved. Sorry if you hear some noises. I got a cat over here to the right who likes to jump in my blinds. Um, so, hey, um, you know, I, I did that. Um, it was a great exposure to see what kind of work was happening. And then at that point, I was offered uh, the opportunity to join the board. Uh, I served as board president for about a year uh, before transitioning to uh, CEO for the organization, which I ran for about four years. Um, we did a lot of good work there. Uh, redirected from a charitable trust model to that of a philanthropic collective impact model. Uh, that meaning that we wanted to, to do bigger. We wanted to partner more. We didn't want to just raise funds and just give dollars out. We wanted to see how we could leverage funds, leverage partnerships to achieve, you know, broader output, if you will. And we did that quite a bit. You know, we were able to uh, get our budget where we needed it to. We uh, moved to the big Arbor Way building downtown where we've been worked to develop a nonprofit resource center concept where we provide workshops and joint funding efforts with other entities serving as fiscal sponsors and such. So it was, it was really fun. It was great. It was a good opportunity to work across across county, you know, with different leaders across the San Joaquin Valley, to be honest with you. Um, and in doing so, you learn a lot about the similarities in our regions and then even some of the differences. Uh, we're not so unique, you know, uh, to say the least. And I think uh, shared experiences, whether positive or negative or something to learn from. So this whole process uh, with United Way was wonderful. Um, from a governmental side, I have served as a planning commissioner for the city of Merced. I did that for two years. Um, part of a few big ordinances that passed, including the cannabis ordinance, which was a big one, a big discussion for quite some time. Um, did that for two years. Former chamber member for the Greater Merced Chamber. Uh, also served as the chair for the California Accountable Community Health Initiative. I'll try and say that twice. That was a initiative that was uh, spread across California, funded through a few different grantors like Blue Cross, Kaiser and such, looking at creating a uh, whole wellness system where we can better provide services to individuals around healthcare, uh, which was great. So, um, you know, I've been lucky and blessed enough to have opportunity to have these multifaceted discussions with people that um, aren't off often afforded to you in other roles. Uh, being with the CBO, like you, it's priceless what you obtain in the community. It's priceless of who you, you begin to realize who is a, uh, the movers and shakers, you know, who are really committed to try and make things happen in the city. So it was, a, it was a great time for me to really realize, you know, what we could do here, you know, what made us better and what holds us back, if you will. So that's really what's drove me to run for council, you know, over the last four years. All right, well, awesome. Th thank you for sharing. You know, I know our audience appreciates getting uh, into uh, a perspective into where you came from and, and what it motivates you to run. Uh, you know, for your next question, kind of broad, but just to get to know you and your, your general platform, uh, what are the top three issues that you hope to address as a member of the city council if elected? Yeah, uh, I mean, one of the top issues is, is the brain drain. You know, I'm sure we've heard that phrase a few times. We, we have the luxury of having UC and a, and a community college in our backyard. I mean, you're getting the, the expertise from hands-on certification processes, those degrees are great. And you're getting all the UC degrees coming out of there and we're losing that human capital. You know, how do we maintain the human capital that we accrue in our backyard and keep them here locally? Um, you know, I love seeing the, you know, the notes and the, the posts and the, uh, the publications of UC students, you know, after graduation from here, they go off and do wonderful things in other regions. Uh, but it's, it's also somewhat, you know, a catch-22. You'd like to see, you know, wouldn't that be awesome if we were to retain their entrepreneurial skills, you know, and or whatever drive and grit that got them to accomplish what they did in those other regions here locally, right? And how do we create those opportunities? And that's something I really want to look at. The Virginia Smith Trust is something I want to get heavily involved in and how those scholarships go out. And if we could attach fellowships to them, create some sort of seed fund and start looking at uh, promoting entrepreneurialism within, you know, within Merced. You know, we have some great resources. We've got Bitwise coming, you know, we have the, the UC Center downtown, you know, there's so many opportunities to, to engage and, and see how we can develop our workforce here locally, but we seem very interconnected at times. And I just want to, I want to see that connection between the city and the UC, you know, become a little, little stronger. And I know that's difficult. The UC is kind of out, you know, out of, out of our area, if you will. And it's hard for, you know, students to get to the cent the city center, if you will, but we need, I think we could do our diligence a little bit better in developing that relationship. Um, for the second issue, obviously is, you know, public safety. Public safety is a big issue here. At least at least on people's minds. Um, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I'd say, you know, it's a conversation that's repetitive with individuals when I engage with them. So, you know, the concept of building community and trust with our public safety officers and staff, you know, is I think one of my top priorities that I want to see. I've, 
I've always enjoyed being the, the medium, if you will, in conversation, you know, and, and trying to serve as that, that individual. So, you know, being in a position as a city council member is, is just that, you know, representing your constituents and being able to engage, you know, those around you that affect the lives of, of those residents and such. So very interested in getting involved at that level, you know, and the sit downs that I've had with MPOA and fire and such and hearing their, their input and understanding uh, the constraining enabling factors that are associated with what they can and can't do if you will, and largely from budgetary standpoints. So it's always interesting to see how we reallocate those dollars. And uh, third, one of the biggest issues I find here too is just the, the types of businesses that we begin to bring into the city of Merced. You know, the service sector industry is the low income 15 to 20 hour, low rate pay, no benefits type jobs that don't help uplift our community and provide a livable wage. That's, that's one of the biggest issues I have is if keep attracting service sector industries to empty department store lots and these aren't logistics, these aren't distribution centers, manufacturing, et cetera, that provide livable wage jobs where people can buy a home, you know, and that's, to me, that's important. You know, uh, as an HR director in my previous position, I remember, I think one year and it was 2015, 2015 or 2016, I got around <clears throat> 20 some odd applications for a home, you know, where our employees were buying homes. That was cool. Like, that was great to see. I remember meeting with the CFO and the COO on that and, and sharing that information. Like, we're doing a great job. We're empowering our employees to live a better quality life, you know, and, and I, I like that. I like to see those employers that, that look to bring those types of employment to Merced and instead of subsidizing pay with, you know, referring individuals to social assistance, employers should own that if they can. Obviously, small business is a different, a different ballpark, if you will, but jobs are very important. You know, I'll sum it up with that. And that's what I want to work towards with our work investment group at the county level. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. And and I would say jobs are very important. And, and, and it's one of those things that uh, I think that different, well, it, it leads into our next question. So, you know, a walk down Merced Main Street in the year 2020 will show you a revitalization boom. Uh, historic theaters have gone new facelifts, new bars, restaurants, and businesses have opened. Pre-COVID, Merced experienced the highest personal income growth of any metro area in the country for the past five years. This Central Valley city was beginning to look like a place of prosperity. However, still at least one in every three babies and toddlers in our city lived in poverty pre-COVID, and that number has likely only been exacerbated. Merced's surely a city on the rise, but some citizens are getting left on the ground. What are some steps you'd like to take to get us back on track where we were uh, and make sure that prosperity is shared evenly amongst Mercedians? No, that's a, that's a great point. That was a multifaceted question and a great way to look at it. Um, you know, first and foremost, I'm, I'm a big data person. I love sharing data. I love shared data systems. Um, we are very compartmentalized within the city and even further within the county. And that, that disconnect, it makes it very hard to provide wraparound services, if you will, and whole person care for families, uh, particularly young families, children zero to five, right? These are the families where, you know, likelihood you can have a, a huge trajectory in terms of impact, you know, when you have that effect early on down the livelihood of this family, you know, you will see an increase, right, in their prosperity if you can get there quick enough, right? Farther down the line you go, the harder it is to, to recondition and or socialize an individual or whatever it may be to, to get them to where they need to go. So I think we need to, you know, we're very reactive, uh, with policy and reactive with our services um, instead of being proactive and trying to address issues before they become a larger issue. Uh, chief example with homelessness, if you will, um, you know, a lot of the funding I'd seen coming at one point, former position I had, we served as a collaborative applicant for the continuum of care, which is the large group in the county that's responsible for addressing homelessness. A very great, large, interconnected group uh, of a number of private, nonprofit, and governmental entities. But the point being is when we when we worked through that, I remember seeing funding that would just it hurt to get because I'd have a you know a family come into our building and say you know I need maybe four or five hundred dollars stipend to get through the month. My you know my husband got hurt at work, he had to take two weeks off, but he'll be back next week and we'll be fine. Um, I say I can't help you because the grant funding I have, you have to be chronically homeless for eighteen months before I can lend you any services, right? So you let somebody fall you know hundred feet before you pick them up. You know what I mean? As opposed to if they're tripping, you grab their hand and make sure they can keep moving forward. And that's that proactive versus reactive state that I just I cringe when I see that type of stuff. But I mean, personally, the, the term the city on the rise to me is very ambiguous. It's a broad stroke. You know, um, what does that mean? You know, and how do we define that? You know, is it the private investment we see downtown with the Tioga and El Cap and the Mainzer? You know, or is it lifting our families out of poverty? Is it attracting industries that pay livable wages? 
or is it, you know, making our communities more active and walkable, you know, so we can combat all the public health issues we have across our city and our county? Is it building inward to reduce spatial mismatch instead of sprawling outward and chewing up agricultural land and, re and basically reducing access to resources? I mean, there's so many different ways we can measure this. So how are we measuring that phrase? And I don't mean to be ambiguous in my response, but that really is what it comes down to. Um, I'm very much a systems thinker. Measurements, outputs, outcomes are the way I look at things. So I would like to see a definition of the city on the rise and how we measure that, you know, um, because if not, it's incredibly qualitative um, and subjective. So I, uh, I appreciate the phrase, but I, I like concrete policy and, and, and concrete outputs. So um, it's kind of where I land on that one. All right. Well, thank you. I, th I think you mentioned uh, reallocation earlier, so that leads into this question. You know, over the last few years, the city has gained a new revenue source in the form of tax money from marijuana. In our city, the council gets discretion over 40% of the tax money generated from that source. Uh, the council is also, also has discretion over its general fund, of which much of it is spent on first responders and community development. Considering the funding of first responders is pitted against funding for community development, almost every budget cycle. Uh, do you believe anything should change in the way that we allocate our discretionary funds? Well, I think, you know, there's a process, right? Um, everything is a process. And you talk about community engagement and any pluralistic democracy that we're trying to hold when we engage. Uh, a good reference point I always use is the IAPP Two Spectrum International Association of Public Participation. Great way to look at how you're going to engage your community when you're looking at whether passing a policy, an ordinance, and or, you know, establishing whatever it is, revitalizing a park, right? You want that level of engagement to be clear because which, whatever level of engagement you pick, whether it's consult, collaborate, empower, you know, whatever that level is comes with a promise to the community. And that's very important because communication is the number one thing that lapses in any discussion we have with community in workshops and every study sessions, however many of those we want to hold. We got to be clear on what the goal is here and what the level of involvement is. And I think that's, that's where we start the discussion more than anything, you know, but I just, I think there's a, there's a lot to do in that arena and it's very contextual. I mean, if you have something specific you'd like to discuss, definitely into it, but, you know, depending on how we redirect funds, obviously everything has a, um, you know, an adverse effect, right? Everything has a cause, you know, and then there's going to be something that's going to follow. So if you think about, for instance, right, you know, police reform, it's a big discussion, right? It's defund police or police reform. Police reform is important. Defund police will not be a phrase you will hear from my mouth. But when it comes to reforming police, yes, and full support. If you look at the police budget, you'll see the budget cuts in training over the last few years. Uh, it, it's, it's crazy that you're gonna demand reform of a, of a police department who doesn't have the training budget anymore. You know, I mean, there's certain things we gotta look at. So there's a perfect example where the community is demanding something which is well-deserved and warranted, yet the city has moved budget dollars around that have bound the hands of these individuals to make themselves, you know, to provide that training and that reform effort, right? So it's things like that, that, you know, when you talk about moving one dollar to another and seeing what that effect is that we have to consider, and that's just a good, one good example, and I'm sure there's eons of examples as we go through the budget of the effect that it had, you know, uh, when the decision was made. So it's definitely contextual. Uh, every decision, you know, when it comes to budgeting is, is difficult. Um, that was something, uh, you know, you can't put a, a dollar amount on, on a human being, right? I mean, that's what we're in a budget. You're looking at dollars, you know, and deciding what services are going to be provided, which affect, you know, the residents in our community. So it's, it's not easy. You know, it's a lot to think about. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of projects would you like to see happen on our city council to improve our infrastructure in our city, uh, you know, including roads, parks, as well as our bike and trail system? Yeah, um, firm believer in walkable communities. I, I, I love the idea of it. Um, Livermore is one of my favorite places to go. I know it sounds funny. It's not like some crazy big city, but that downtown Livermore area is just so cool and so walkable. I mean, really it is. Everything is interconnected. You have the one lanes, you have the diagonal parking, which reduces the speed and it makes you feel more receptive to walking around, right? It just and considering, again, our public health data from a county perspective, we can reduce our sedentary lifestyles and increase the walkability of our community to help increase our public health data, right? So like the land patterns that we already have, like the auto-centric roadway systems, we can't change those things. Those are, those are big, right? But small incremental changes, those evolve communities. Those begin to change neighborhoods, right? So you don't have to have these large changes everywhere, but where's the smart growth that you can achieve things, right? So your town centers, your main streets, those urban infill locations, right? Those are where you're going to want to focus on, you know, and then in doing that, there's a, there's a, a trickle effect. And I know that term sometimes is used, you know, haphazardly, but 
those those provide changes in areas where economic conditions, you know, have been harsh, you know, and where affordable housing should be coupled, right? So as long as we begin to connect things and resources, it makes it more livable and it makes it more easier to travel, if you will, by an alternative resource other than automobiles. So if you look at our, our trails, we are very interconnected throughout the city. I think it's awesome. I mean, you can start on one trail on 59 and make it all the way through Merced to the other side. And it, it's really great. Um, seeing how those connect within the city and bringing you to the city centers, bringing you to the resources that are available in the community, whether it's an educational resource, a governmental resource, or whether it's for consumption, you know, downtown, whatever it is, how we develop our town is how we either enable or constrain the opportunity to walk and bike through our through our regions and i i do love i think we have a great foundation of trails and i just think really it's an upkeep issue more than anything um you know it's a lighting issue you know a lot of people have complained about that it really is it's it's huge i have a trail right behind my house that i'd love to run and i, th I think i think you got muted i think Everyone got muted. Uh oh, they get muted. We good now. Good. <laughs> no, but anyway, I'll I'll uh I won't chatter too long, man. But just integrating land use, street design, transportation strategies, those are all part of looking at how, how we collect everything. Again, everything is a system. I'm a very systematic thinker. It keeps things objective, and I, I think that's the way we should look at it. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you for your perspective on that. Uh, in, to our audience, don't forget you can. Feel free to write into the chat at any time, as Corey just reminded us, uh, to ask a question or we simply use the raise hand function uh, and, and you can uh, ask your question live. And feel free to use this opportunity to speak to a city council member uh, and get their perspective on the issues that matter to you. Uh, and so, you know, without further ado, Youth Intercept's 2019 and 2020 enrollment sit, sat at just under 10,000 students. Uh, this growing base, along with other factors, has caused a surge in the number of residents within our county. Uh, the California Department of Finance reported that the county is the fastest growing in the state, showing that more than 4,000 people moved into Merced County last year alone. Uh, this has led to Merced's notoriously low vacancy rate of 1%. However, in some cases, you know, in an effort to create additional housing, uh, like in the case of the Tioga, Olding how older housing units are being renovated to attract individuals with higher incomes, such as professors and staff. Uh, as a city council member, would you promote the development of affordable housing units? And if you would, how do you ensure that those homes uh, built don't just remove affordable housing from those with lower income? Of course, I mean, I'm a firm believer in, in mixed income housing. Um, Again, we learn from each other and we are a community. I'm a very communal person. And I think uh, the opportunity when you provide mixed income housing, you provide an access to resources and or individuals that are, you know, that are good. I mean, it's good, it's good to mix, you know, I just feel like we put walls up so quickly and we, you know, to have a low income housing all by itself, you know, to me serves little purpose. You know, mixed income housing is interesting to me. You know, I, I think it's a concept I don't see enough here in Merced as we begin to develop. And more often than any, I, I think the closer we develop inward again and we avoid the, the urban sprawl patterns that we do, the better off we are collectively as a city. We, we fail to build inward, we continue to build outward. And that deals with negotiations and bartering with the county. It deals with having to expand public works, which are already inhibited from being able to do a lot of things they wish they could, creating new waterways, et cetera. It's a, it's a slippery slope as we build outward. And what does it achieve, you know? And, and as you said, who has the access to the housing? You know, I mean, this is huge. And I know the city has made a, a really great effort. Uh, the, the planning department has really put in a lot of time and effort. And they have some great, great documents out there that show it. Um, you know, it's attracting the developers to do it, you know, and it's, it's attracting them to, to see the investment and the ROI that's worthwhile for them. And that's a, that's, a, that's a hard thing to say, but it really comes down to that. So how do we package our city and how do we, how do we uh, sell our city, if you will, uh, not to sound crass, but that's important. How are we marketed and to attract this investment? Um, you know, there's people who, who will invest for a loss because they see a return on the community. I mean, I've seen this in the nonprofit sector. You have these angel investors that understand that there's a, there's a social benefit to this, you know, and those are the folks we need to seek out. Again, you guys, we, we have a very special community and we are building up so much human capital here. I don't understand why we have not attracted these industries that should be here. Um, it's, it just blows me away. So, I mean, with the jobs comes the, comes the pay and comes the affordability of the homes, right? And I really feel like we, that's a big starting point for us is ensuring that we provide these occupations that are accessible, you know, and we got a lot of work to do on that side. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so you said you were hesitant about the phrase uh, city on a rise, uh, but you, you believe that marketing our, our, our city is important. So just curious, do you have a phrase or, or a way that you want to envision Merced uh, going forward that you think would be uh, positive in our, in our life? No, no, no slogans, uh, no, no hollow words or promises. Uh, I don't want to do that to you guys. And I don't want to, um, you know, say something like that. I mean, you know, the one thing I do say that sums it up in a sentence is, you know, I, I would love to make Merced, you know, I want to make it as easy as possible for businesses to operate, operate successfully in the city of Merced, to open and operate. Those are the two biggest things, you know, so how do we do that? We usually, we look at the conditional use permitting process. We look at the zoning, we look at the available land to provide this A, B, C, D, or E opportunity in industry. And we begin to, you know, basically re-examine the way in which we are, we are um, offering opportunity to these uh, industries within our area. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a question in the chat. We're going to go to Priya. Priya asks, Jeremy, how would you attract more investors to our city? What would you do differently? Well, yeah, well, one of the interesting parts that I've always heard is the workplace surveys that are conducted uh, within the city, right, at the county level too, right? is it never seems to capture, again, the capital that we're building at the UC and Merced College because those degrees haven't been achieved, right? They're in process, et cetera. So it, it seems like we're not able to attract those industries for that reason. And I've heard this in a few work sessions I've been involved in across county and, and city committees and such, which I find it to be odd. Um, there's gotta be a different way. I mean, you think of like the city of Davis, right? When they brought the UC there and what that did for them over the years, right? And so looking again at, at, at other cities for smart practices, right? And I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that. I, I don't have a magic wand, but I, I truthfully believe that we need to look at the shared learning experiences of those around us. You know, um, we can't do it alone. We, it's gonna be a regional effort, but we can definitely learn from others. I found the most successes I've ever had in my career and or any kind of program and initiative I wanted to launch by doing a comparative analysis of those around that are achieving the goals that I'd like to see. And I think we could definitely learn from those regions. And that to me is a starting point. Um, but more often than anything, work, work investment is, is, is where the conversation is and, and how is that, how are we working on that regional plan across the San Joaquin Valley because we are tasked with that and that's definitely a board, the WIA board that I would definitely be in, uh, interested in being involved in and, and helping uh, provide a uh, perspective of Merced uh, for that board. So um, that would be the starting point, if you will, uh, Priya. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to talk about and I definitely welcome the discussion uh, to hear input from others and kind of see what they're looking for. All right, she said thank you. She appreciates it. We got another question in the chat. This one was sent in anonymously. It asks, after this pandemic, do you see more support coming from the city for organizations that create events that bring the community together, particularly the communities that are underserved? Oh, yeah. I mean, you say post-pandemic? Uh, yeah, it says after yeah. this. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's a, there's a lot. <laughs> To bring us all back out would be beautiful, man. Um, I, I would love to see this city back out and lively as it was. Again, working with the community, there was a lot of events. That was one of the things I was really taken aback about again uh, with this community before I got heavily involved when I was just kind of work and school. It was is to see how much was going on. I mean, there's a lot going on. I don't know how many people would always say, oh, there's nothing to do. And it's like, there's a million things to do. If you look at it, there's about 40 flyers on every building downtown and there's something happening tonight here or there, right? So it's been odd, you know, during COVID to see that die down, you know? Um, I was just talking with Greater Merced Chamber earlier about the concept of the drive-in behind, you know, the parking lot behind the bistro, I believe, uh, in that area, you know, to be utilized for like a the drive of a uh, drive and movie thing. It's just great. Like those are ideas that you could do during COVID, right? Because you have the separation, if you will, but I am all for um, the partnering with our community uh, orgs that are, that are looking to bring these events to the town, right? Because again, that's the number one thing. What do we have to do? And I've been a part of these groups and I've been a part of these collaborative initiatives that are trying to put on events, whether it's recreational or informative, whatever it may be. And it's, it's hard, it's us, you know, doing it. It's us getting donations. It's us hustling and moving our, you know, moving as hard as we can, very grassroots. Uh, and it'd be nice to see the city uh, be a little more involved in that. Um, there are some champions in the city that will do great things. I've worked alongside them when it comes to community events and I'm very thankful for those individuals, but I definitely think we could do more um, for getting these, uh, these nonprofits and other CBOs the opportunity to carry out these events or the schools, whatever it may be. Um, I don't know. We just got, we got to do more when it comes to that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's warm. It's fuzzy, man. It keeps us, keeps us engaged. It keeps us communal and it doesn't keep us in our homes. You know, it, it's, it's a good thing. All right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
what and how will, uh, Claudia asks in the chat, what and how will you increase youth job opportunities in Merced? Yeah, well, we, we, again, we would start with looking at what our industries are currently here and what our workforce looks like, right? So you're going to get these surveys, they're going to have some skewed data because it's not going to be inclusive of what's going on, you know, within our schools themselves, the post-secondary schools, right? And that's really, that's your baseline, right? Here's what our, here's what our industry needs are, if you will, currently, and here's what we're feeding through the educational pipeline. Is it aligning? And I'd be frivolous to think that WIA isn't already doing some sort of this, you know, and comparable analysis of industry versus employability, right? But what is that population that didn't reach there, right? We still have, I think, over 25% of individuals, 25 and older, still lack a high school diploma. This is huge. Like, that's a huge population. And high school diploma is an entry point for a lot of positions, uh, you know, whether blue collar or into the, the, the more white collar type of work you would be doing. So it's, it's focusing on those small wins before we can get to the larger win of attracting this giant businesses. We do have to beef up certain sections of our workforce that are lacking. Um, and I think that's one of the starting points there, you know, and there's some great stuff going on at the adult school where they're passing, they're getting a lot of people through there and it's, it's really cool to see and invigorating. But the sad part is once they get through there is, okay, now where's the job? Right, you know, now hopefully I can find a job after, right? And it's, we can't miss the opportunities to bring in the right industries that will provide employability. You know, I, I used to have this debate, um, you know, and I'll be candid with it, you know, with a lot of folks at the, the prior position I had with Westmark, I used to work with a lot of welders, you know, and fabricators. And I used to kind of, you know, get Josh me about school. Ah, you're going to school, you're spending all this time in school. I do fine this way. And, and it was interesting. To me, it was interesting because they had a valid point. They put in a lot of work, um, all of that hard work, that manpower work of pushing and pushing and pushing, you know, uh, didn't do the school thing. And then they saw, you know, the school thing come out and you get your degree and you get afforded a different opportunity, right? That might have took 10 years of work to get to, work experience, if you will, right? So it's that comparable analysis of what our, our skill set is currently and how we can add to that, whether it's the certifications, whether it's working with the unions to get into their opportunities for uh, the internships and such, you know, there's, there's a lot of connectivity in Merced, but again, the connectivity isn't there. There's a lot to do, but we're all separated. I've sat in so many meetings where we bring people to the table and you would hear, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Oh, I'm doing, oh my gosh, you five people are doing the same thing, just a little different. Why aren't we all working together and leveraging the resources for a larger output, right? Or joining funding or whatever it may be, right? And that goes across, you know, I'm speaking from a community lens with CBOs, but that goes in the government, you know, that goes in with public, working with private sector individuals, right? That goes in with education, working with private or nonprofits. So it's, it goes the same across all the lines, just different contracts and different language. All right, well, th thank you for that perspective. Mm -hmm. So last month, uh, the current Merced City Council voted against a Black Lives Matter mural that would have been placed in downtown Merced. Uh, the mural would have been privately funded in the end. It was a 5-2 vote against the installment of the mural. Going forward from then, uh, what type of initiatives would you be a proponent of for communities of people that feel they've been historically underserved? Oh, I mean, anything to empower one's voice, you know, the. <laughs> the fact that it's hard for some people to say Black Lives Matter blows my mind. Um, I, I, I don't know. I can't understand that. Um, it's a, it's a statement that should come out fluid and freely and, and no problem saying, you know, so I, I hate to see things politicized and I feel like that's where we've gone with it. And it's unfortunate uh, because it's not, uh, and it shouldn't be right. So, you know, anything we can do to empower, empower the voice to be, to be heard, if you will. Right. And that's done through art. That's done through community-based initiatives. That's fun, done through outreach and engagement, you know, and, and being act actively listening. Um, you know, I mean, I feel like the council can do a much better job of actively listening and promising what exactly we want out of that, that engagement, right? What are we really trying to achieve? As I mentioned earlier, when you engage the public, that's the baseline for everything for me. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, here's what we have and here's what you need. It's, I just need to listen. I need to listen for a while. I really need to gauge this and understand before I can say we have this option in A or B, you know what I mean? Because this is, this is a big deal and this is a big issue. This is a national issue. This is something that doesn't um, just pertain to Merced. Um, you know, but I, I, I see it a multi, you know, faceted way in which the way we can address it. But I, I would think that, you know, as long as we empower our voices and individuals still retain their ability to be heard in one fashion or another, I think we're still on the same page. We just can't, you can't silence that, uh, the good and the bad, unfortunately, that's freedom of speech. And uh, we got to be able to engage both. I'm just hoping for a healthy dialogue with this. I, I really am. I just, I just want an objective discussion, you know, more than anything. 
All right, thank you. you Claude, I've got another question in the chat. She asks, how will you include non-English speaking residents in the civic engagement process? Oh yeah, in terms of with between the city and residents, you know, just local government as a whole. I assume so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, literature that goes out for one is always a difficulty that you see because not everything goes out in English, Spanish, and Mal, right? You know, which are three prominent languages we have here in, in, the, in the city of Merced. And I, I just say this because I'm familiar with it, with a lot of the uh, outreach efforts we put out, you know, and with CBOs and such. And it's not an easy task. Um, and I just named three. I mean, there's there's a multitude of languages within the city of Merced. And I don't mean to leave any out, but I'm just exactly pointing to just that. There's there's quite a bit. Um, and it's not easy to reach necessarily everyone, but it's damn sure important, you know, that we do that. And, you know, to make every ability, every possible, you know, avenue we have to reach individuals. Again, whether it's social media, whether it's a text, whether it's, uh, you know, the flyers we do, whatever mode we choose to do, we got to figure out how to reach people. We got to bring services to them in their language and acknowledge that we are a multicultural community. And we are just that. So that requires our local government to take that same multicultural approach and communications. Um, we'd be uh, shorting a great deal of our population if we didn't. So. Uh, firm believer in that. Um, at United Way, we had a, a language a language interpreting program. Uh, it was pretty fun. We had about nine different languages we provided in different settings, including governmental settings uh, for interpreters to ensure that residents could engage with local officials um, in a manner that allowed them to understand, you know, what was being discussed. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we got another question sitting in the chat anonymously. They ask, you mentioned earlier that the UC is a little uh, a little way out from the city. How do you think we can help the community embrace the campus more, even if they don't have a direct connection to it? And how do you think we can help the students embrace the city, even if they're only here for a few years while getting their degree? Yeah, that's a rough one, man. That, the second part of that question more than anything, you know, is how do you create that connectivity and call this place home, right? And, um, you know, I'll start with the second, I guess, go back to the first is, uh, you know, you, you connect them by showing them the quality of life here can be something more, right? I mean, we all have something to offer this community. And the minute you guys come out of that UC, you have plenty to offer, right? So where is it that you can apply those skills to make this place better? Why is it worth investing for you here, right? And there's there's a lot to look around. We have a beautiful surroundings around us. We have some issues, but I'll tell you what, like this town's cool. It's still, it's a good motion of traffic. It's a, it's a great area in terms of environment around us and natural occurrences, you know, that we can enjoy a fluidity of trails throughout the city there's a lot here we got a lake again we got the UC we got Merced College it, it's a, it's there's stuff here it's the, the problem is what we have is getting people to want to put their time and interest in and in growing it right uh, an interesting point that an interesting thing I saw in Turlock is the local ownership of downtown buildings you know they did a great job in downtown Turlock where I believe it was high 90 percentages of buildings owned in downtown Turlock were locally owned and that's interesting because then you have a local vested interest in your community, right? So how do we get the, our students at the UC to feel like they locally own a part of this city, right? That they are a part of it. And I would welcome a discussion on that. I can't tell you I have a clear answer on that. I definitely say there's a need for it. And I don't want to talk around the question. Um, rather, this is one of those great times where you get to have a study session with people. Um, this is the fun part about council. You know, when you get on council, you get the, you get the opportunity to pull people together. And, and hear their voices. That's the whole point of having a district is to be able to represent constituents. So any issue we're going to talk about on the council, even something like this, right, is I'm going to be representing the individuals in my district and tell you what their concerns and interests are and how we can do this better, right? Um, government doesn't end by you guys vote, by anybody voting for me and getting me in the office, right? It, it, it begins once we get in there, then we start working together. There's still work to be done. You know, the vote is the first step. And then it's like, how am I engaging and how are we working together? Because that's where the real work starts to happen. So that's a, that's a tough one. It's really a tough one, especially with transportation. Again, you guys are all the way out there. And I know with the Lyft and Uber, that's been a huge dent, you know, in terms of getting people to, uh, again, to the city centers and such. But, um, you know, there's, there's land out there that's already been preserved for building and development, you know, so we'll see if that'll create some connectedness. You know, so you guys, uh, I say you guys, because I know you're, you're still there, Jesse, is, uh, is the fact that, you know, you guys, you guys really are kind of on an island, you know, until you drive out far enough in the Merced, past Paulson and such, you know, and start getting in the northern Merced, then you're, you're in town, right? And so I think as we build out in that area, you know, I keep frowning on outward, you know, development, but 
in that area it makes sense, right? To bring that connection together. And that would, I think that would be the first start to make people feel a little closer to town. So they're not hitting so much open space on the way through. And I know it sounds like optics and, you know, but it's, it's important, you know? Um, and the, the first part of that question, can you, I'm sorry, Jesse, if you can run that back one more time. Asking, so uh, how do you think we can help the community embrace the campus uh, more, even if they don't have a direct connection to it? Yeah, I think the downtown campus center was the biggest step to that. Um, I mean, it's, it's lively as heck, man. You see your UC staff coming out all day, walking around downtown, you get to run into some folks and it's great again for, for that communal engagement. So, I mean, that, that in itself was huge in connecting the university to the downtown area, right? Uh, from a staffing perspective and students who have to visit that area, right? So I think, I think that was great. And I think just, just in doing that, you guys now, I guess seeing you guys, you guys, you guys now have a home downtown, you know, you guys have a hallmark of UC, you know, right there across from City Hall. To me, that's iconic where they positioned it. I think it's really awesome. And to me, that speaks to the relationship that we need to develop between the city and the UC. You know, I mean, we are right, we are neighbors. You know, I'm going to see you in your office, you know, waving to you. And we got to make sure that we're working closely together. So I think, uh, you know, first step was there. And then how do we expand those, uh, those resources, you know, and that, that relationship beyond just, you know, the admin building downtown and look at, you know, holding more events between the city and the UC together, you know, those joint efforts, you know, we all have a big network and we all have a big group that we can bring together for different types of needs and or events. So it's, uh, we got to be collaborative. Jesse, we got to be collaborative and communal in what we do as a, as a local government. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. Uh, to our audience, uh, we only got a couple questions left. So if you guys got a question on your mind, be sure to utilize this time that we got left to shoot in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, uh, Mr. Martinez, you, in a recent article in the County Times, you're quoted, when we engage our community, we need to be clear on the intent of the public participation goal. Are we there to inform, consult, involve, collaborate, or empower? Each of these comes with a promise to the public. In your opinion, what is the intent of public participation in the civic engagement process? And what promise does that, uh, to the public, does that require of public representatives? Yeah, I mean, I think it's relevant and, and to the context of whatever's being looked at, right? You know, there's a reason why there's a spectrum. You know, uh, do we need to involve you in the semantics of getting this, uh, you know, the, the nuts and bolts crafted? Probably not. You know, let's, I don't want to spin your wheels. We all have something to do as, as a community, right? We have jobs and families and such. So it's finding the moment where the, where the community needs to be involved in that issue. And I say needs, and I don't mean like they don't need to be involved in and anything but I mean that and there are some really trivial operational components of stuff that you just don't want to be a part of I don't want to be a part of you know but it's part of the process right you know and and I think where you involve them is important or you know where they involve it's the promise to the public you know and that's what lacks clarity sometimes you know and you can't have um, your community come in too late into the game when you've already set the framework for everything that makes it too hard to build it back down right and build it back up so it's finding where they fit in the process and whether that's consultative whether it's collaborative whether it's empower empower being they make the final decision by consensus consulting meaning I need you guys to be a part of this workshop to know what the community needs you know examples like that and it really is contextual to the issue and or policy that we're looking at and um, I just think again it's important that we communicate what that level is yeah thank you mm -hmm. so according to a group of homeless service providers and advocates the Merced County continuum of care there were over 600 homeless individuals living within Merced County in 2019 uh, this is an increase of 93 people from just the year prior, and I know we touched on this a bit er earlier, but understanding that this is a huge issue with lots of organizations uh, playing a role in this, uh, in your view, what is the city council's role in addressing this issue for our community? Yeah, um, it's a big role. Again, we are the county seat. Um, and I'm sure a good chunk of it is here. The county is largely rural, you know, and um, homelessness does occur in some rural contexts, but it's primarily within city centers. Uh, you know, and so every city within the county has an obligation, obviously Merced being the size that it is, and with the influx that we have here, we have a larger obligation, in my opinion, uh, especially when we're the county seat and we have all the centralized resources, right? Your HSAs, your Catholic Charities, all that great stuff. We have your rescue mission, everybody doing great work to address this issue. Um, what I find interesting is the approach that we take. Again, uh, are we looking at proactive measures so we don't continue the funnel of creating this homeless population? How are we closing off that funnel? and still servicing at the same time, right? Because you can service and service and create a laundry list of individuals who are still gonna need the assistance. 
And, you know, and that's what you would see on the BSPDAT survey of individuals. That list will get bigger and bigger and bigger for the housing. And it doesn't matter if we're housing one to two people a month, that list gets bigger faster, right? And it's, so how, how do we learn to provide the wraparound services that are preventative and still ones that are service orientated to remedy whatever issues there are, right? And that's, the COC is doing that, um, you know, and I always, I always posit individuals to really look into the continuum of care. Uh, there's, it's a great group. It's a big amount of, a big, big group of people doing things across the county. Again, public, private, nonprofits, everybody's there, education. And it's good representation. It's director level representation, which means there's decision makers at the table that can help move things forward. Um, I think more often than anything, it's the funding. Uh, what kind of funding are we getting in and how can we utilize it best? Um, we got to look at smart practices. The navigation center we're getting is going to be great. It's going to be a great central hub for individuals to find resources instead of having that, that spatial mismatch concept, as I mentioned, where services are provided throughout the city or the county. And when you're talking to a, a, a highly mobile population who doesn't necessarily have the travel capabilities to reach those services, it becomes tenfold harder to address them, right? And, and to provide those services. So. It's, uh, I tip my hat to the COC, um, and that's a group I definitely want to uh, hear from and work alongside with because uh, this issue isn't getting any easier. Um, but I think we need to focus on the small wins, and I think we have some good ones coming up, you know, with the Navigation Center and the D Street Shelter expanding, you know, their beds. And so obviously COVID, you know, hinders this to some degree, but to see the uh, effort still occurring during COVID is promising uh, from our, our developers and such. So. Um, I feel good that we're, we're on the right direction. It's just, it's a very, it's a multifaceted issue, uh, Jesse. It's not something that is, uh, you're talking, you got city, you got state, you got Caltrans, you got railroad, you got, you know, these are all individuals that are gonna want a different piece of the issue or not want a piece of the issue, if you will. So um, there's a lot to be discussed and a lot of decisions to be made. That's that principal agent relationship, just making sure that we are um, giving each other the right information to make the right decisions. and. Again, that's data sharing. It's, it's, it's data sharing. The more we connect our data and the more we create shared spaces to learn, you know, from each other, the more we can be more informed on making our decisions, you know, especially on a multifaceted issue like homelessness. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I uh, appreciate that perspective. Uh, Corey, do we have any last questions in the, in, waiting in the chat? I have not received any more, but if anybody would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, now would be the time to do it. Hi, Corey, this is Priya. Hi, Jeremy, this is Priya again. I have a quick question. Jeremy, earlier you said you, you believe in reform the police and not the phrase defund the police. But a lot of folks in the city are asking about defunding the police. So how would you bridge that gap? What would you do to bridge that well, I think it's a, it's an educational, um, not even educational, it's an information sharing um, session, if you will. And, and I, it was enlightening for me to, to talk with PD on a few occasions during this campaign and to hear, um, again, the constraining factors that they deal with. Um, they're, they're not the only ones, the public aren't the only ones that see the need for the reform, you know, and that's, that's what's interesting. Um, so it's how do we get on the right page together to see how the dollars are spent and why they're spent a certain way. Uh, I think, again, uh, the sharing of information allows us to make the better judgment, um, even from a public participation side, uh, to reduce subjectivity and be able to uh, get to the table with somebody without assumptions, right? Um, there's a national debate going on around this, and nationally, you can phrase your, your values based on that national debate and forget about what's actually happening in Merced and look at the local context in Merced around this issue. And is it at the level that you see at other areas? And what are what is holding back uh, or enabling police to do better or not do better, right? Um, so it's really a two-way discussion I feel that needs to be had. And I'm excited to work with neighborhood associations and, and our police and public safety officers to, to see what, what those are, you know, and how we can how we can serve them better so they can serve the community better. But we all have the same goal, and I feel we really do. And it sounds altruistic, but we all want, you know, this community to be safer and more prosperous. So uh, I'm a firm believer on both sides are intent on doing just that. Thank you. I appreciate the response. You bet, Priya. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Priya. If anyone else has a question, feel free to chime in. If not, we'll move on uh, and feel free to write it and we'll go back to it. Uh, before we end the closing, we'd like to give uh, the candidate a minute or so for any closing remarks. So, Mr. Martinez, thank you for joining us. What would you like our audience members uh, to really remember about you tonight? 
Yeah, um, more often than anything, man, the one thing I want people to take away is is the altruism, altruism and honesty you're going to get from me. I'm straightforward. Um, you know, during some endorsements and discussions with uh, folks, you know, I gave answers that may not be what they'd wanted to hear, but I'm not going to promise the sky, you know, and and not give it to you, right? So we, we need to be smart as council members and and knowing what we can achieve in our term, right? And and how we work collectively with everyone. So. Or I just want you guys to know I'm, I'm here to think as objectively as possible. Um, I think we, it's our biggest issue um, as elected officials is, is remaining objective and understanding that we are representing the community, not ourselves, right? And not uh, two or three people we may know with a vested interest in something. We are representing a community. Um, so our, our subjectivity is left at the door when we get on the dais and we are talking on behalf of our district we represent and the city we want to see better. So. I can promise you guys all you will get just that out of me, um, whether it's this issue or that. So I, uh, I appreciate you guys' time. Honestly, I'm really uh, grateful you guys put this on. I'm excited because it's uh, running a campaign in COVID is lonely. Um, so it's great to, uh, to engage you guys and to, to hear these. I love these questions. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm elated, man. So I just uh, appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, we appreciate you joining us too. Uh, you know, we got one last question in the chat. So we're always talking about this quote. We're always talking about downtown, but the expansion stops at Martin Luther King. How can we make that change? Yeah, um, you know, I, Matt Serrato posted something really interesting about this on the Facebook the other day, and I thought it was it was great. You know, he acknowledged that it. it seems like the development ends right there, right, and things going forward from there. You know, it's the downtown corridor, um, which again, I've always. <laughs> So what frowned on again too is how does it in there and why does it in there? You know, um, there are some great businesses that continue onward and you know, the lack of upkeep, you know, again, getting to the sidewalks, the lighting, the shade and the trees, you're not gonna wanna walk down there. You're just, you're not, you know, the, the, the crosswalks are fading, you know, again, the sidewalks are all over the place. If it's dark down there, you don't have sufficient lighting. Hot summers, you don't have the shade, the buildings are blighted, et cetera. So, I mean, the first discussion to me more than anything is the discussion with the property owners and their intent with their property and how we can help facilitate increasing the value of that property by getting it occupied, right? And then two, obviously we need to look at our 2030 plan and where it relates to walkability. What are the plans for that area, you know, and what does it look like? Um, there was a great one done, you know, years, years back, but that was back when we had redevelopment dollars that were allocated from the state and that's not there anymore. But there's other ways we got to look at increasing that because yeah, at the same time, I do understand, you know, incrementalism and we are working slowly in our downtown area to make it better, right? And where uh, pieces are being revamped and such, but in a skewed manner, um, you know, it's all in one area, if you will, towards one area. And is that purposeful? Um, I can't speak to that. I could say that maybe it was opportunistic. Those buildings were there, you know, and they were iconic buildings that need to be revitalized. And we don't have that on that area, right? It seems like those old iconic Merced buildings kind of end right there at the theater, if you will. And, and we just kind of let the other ones, you know, become dilapidated. And I just think that, you know, when we revitalize those buildings, it'll entice people to be in that area and it'll entice people to occupy it. Again, I point to Livermore. They did a great presentation at a planning commission conference I was at where they showed how they even demanded as businesses wanted to come into their downtown area that they build their buildings a certain way to be aesthetically pleasing to the walkability that they had already established. So, you know, one example was a Walgreens, which is usually a quick, you know, square box or a rectangle box with some departments inside of it, right? They made it look substantially different. If you ever head down there, you know, it's got, it's more round. It has different types of windows instead of the windows they wanted. The signage is different. Why? Because it's aesthetically pleasing to the walkability they've already established. So it's those types of things that I think are important in city design uh, that we should consider as we start to build down on that, on that side. Shoot. Well, thank you for your perspective on that. Um, I don't think we got any more questions. Uh, yeah, to echo what Corey just said in the chat, thank you for joining everyone. Check out events.ucmerced.edu for our upcoming conversations. Next week, we have City District 3 candidate Alan Brooks on Tuesday, mayoral candidate Michael Bellini on Wednesday, and mayor candidate Matt Serrato on Thursday. Um, thank you, Mr. Martinez, for participating and letting us all get to know you a little bit better. To all of our participants, please, 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 Make sure you register to vote by going to registertovote.ca.gov. Again, that's registertovote.ca.gov. And thank you for joining us. Join us again for our upcoming conversation next week. Uh, and visit, again, visit events.ucmerced.edu for future dates and candidates.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Martinez, for joining us. Thank you, Corey, for running the chat. Thank you for all who were involved. Uh, thank you all for coming, and, and we'll see you again next time. All right. Thank you, guys.